Today I have the pleasure of welcoming an awesome, intelligent person on my channel, Liz Jackson. Liz and I will be talking about presuppositional apologetics. Liz is a professional philosopher and epistemologist. All week I've been telling my friends, hey, I'm having an epistemologist on my channel. And every time I hear, what's an episto, what's a, what's that? So Liz, can you tell us what an epistemologist does? Yeah, so an epistemologist is someone that studies and researches epistemology, <laughs> which epistemology is the study of knowledge and rational belief. And so really what I research is questions. I mean, a lot of the traditional questions and, and some of the stuff we'll talk about in the interview is kind of like, what is knowledge and what are the components of knowledge? Um, a lot of my research is about the question, what should we believe? What justifies a belief? And I'm also interested in like belief versus confidence. So mm -hmm. does belief always go along with high confidence? What justifies belief versus high confidence? What about believing something with low confidence? Um, so it's really all about kind of knowledge, justification and rationality and sort of how those those fit together. Um, and then, I mean, practically what it really looks like is I'm reading papers and writing papers about those and sending them to journals. So it, it's a really fun job. Some people will probably think it's awesome and some people will probably think it's super boring and nerdy, but I really like it, so. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. So it's, it's about just like bridging the gap between, uh, you know, the layperson and then the, the expert. So on that subject, what do you think the average Christian should do? Say, say you're, you're discussing a view, you're trying to figure out the right and the wrong way to look at it. And then some person brings along a professor or a scholar or a philosopher, whatever, an expert in the field. How much worth should we put in that? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think this is just a huge epistemological issue. Like how much should we trust and believe experts? And this is going <laughs> to sound like a cop out, but I guess my answer is like, I think it just kind of depends. Because I think some experts, um, I mean, some experts just really disagree on things. In philosophy, experts disagree right. on, on a lot of stuff, right? Yeah. But I also think in philosophy, experts agree on a lot of stuff. Like, what makes a valid argument? You know, I do think we should weigh what experts say to an extent, at least in a lot of circumstances, while at the same time realizing that experts are people too, and they can be biased and they're not perfect. And uh, I mean, even, you know, setting aside even philosophy, even science, like uh, often will, the, the, the main theories in science radically change and um, they'll be on one trajectory and go on another trajectory. Yeah. And some people think like, we shouldn't trust scientific theories. I don't know if I would go that far, but the point is like, just because an expert says something doesn't mean you should put all your weight in it. But I think at the same time, it is important to look at what the experts are saying and, and yeah. how we balance those just kind of depends on the situation. But after growing up in Christian churches all my life, I've noticed there seemed to be a negative opinion of philosophers in a lot of Christian circles. Can you talk about why we should care about what people who work in the field and have the relevant education have to say on the given subject? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I'm really glad you started with that one. And I, I think I wanted to comment a little bit first on this idea that uh, you know, in Christian circles, philosophy kind of has this negative opinion. And you do kind of see this with like, the God's Not Dead movies, and it's the philosophy professor that's taking everyone's right. faith away and stuff. And, you know, I think what people fail to realize is that in some ways, that's actually the opposite of what's true. And it's really cool, um, as someone who is a Christian and is in philosophy, um, there's actually been like a resurgence of Christian philosophy. Um, a lot of this is actually due to Alvin Plantinga, who is now retired, but he was a Christian philosopher who taught at Notre Dame and some other places. And um, I think he just was this example of someone who was a very strong and dedicated Christian. His faith, his faith is very important to him, but also a very serious philosopher publishing in awesome journals. And I think he just showed people it's not like you have to pick one or the other, you know, you can be a really good Christian and a really good philosopher. And in fact, God gave us our minds so that we can, we can think through things and, and reason, um, you know, about God and the Bible and life and the world and morality. And I think that's, that's part of the reason God made us rational agents. Um, so I guess the first thing I just wanted to say is I think philosophy is super important. I think it's important for Christians to learn to think clearly, to disagree well. And I think that this, this 
presupposition that if you're a philosopher, you want to make everyone be an atheist or you, you hate Christianity just, just isn't true. And I think the number of Christians in philosophy is, is growing and growing. And I personally want to see there to be more connection between these sophisticated answers that Christian philosophers have been publishing to the problem of evil and the problem of divine hiddenness and these arguments for God, connecting that to the everyday Christian who is maybe having doubts about their faith or maybe, you know, wonders, is there really good reasons to believe in God? Can belief in God really be rational? And so I do think there's somewhat of a disconnect here. Like in the church, it seems like people just say, you're, you're a philosopher. You, you can't be a Christian. And then there's all these Christian philosophers doing all this work. And that's one reason I love YouTube channels like yours, because I think they, they can really bring um, what is going on in Christian philosophy to the everyday person. So, so I'm going to go ahead and just give an introductory an introduction of just what presuppositional apologetics is, the method behind it, and a little background. And then we'll continue on with more questions and see where we go from there. Okay, it starts with Romans 1, 18 to 20. While there is a lot of debate among Christians as a whole, the presuppositionalist position would say the passage means all humans know God exists. Because of this, it would make no sense to prove God's existence with arguments to someone who already knows God exists. The presuppositionalist would take the position that there are a number of verses which point to God not wanting us to try to convince the unbeliever that God exists. Therefore, our goal should be to help the non-Christian understand that he actually does know God exists. The presuppositional approach would use the transcendental argument for God to show that everyone actually needs God by showing that God is the precondition of logic and morality. Different presuppositionalists might also include math, the ability to have knowledge, and knowing the future will be like the past as things that we need God for. Popular YouTube apologist Eli Ayala even says, we argue that unless one is operating under Christian presuppositions about the nature of reality, how what we know, what we know, and how we should live our lives, one would lack any rational basis for knowledge, logic, science, history, philosophy, or anything else for that matter. The presuppositionalist would argue that it is futile to try and argue against that as there is no other worldview that could adequately justify these things. Therefore, the non-Christian would realize that they do know God exists because they are using what God has given them and wouldn't, as well as couldn't, use it otherwise. How does that mean Christianity is true? A presuppositionalist would argue from the impossibility of the contrary, that every view leads to utter skepticism, and that leaves Christianity as the one possible worldview left. Liz, can you talk about other types of apologetic methods and how they differ? Yeah, so... I was kind of thinking about this and basically what I did is I took, there's a book, it's called Five Views of Apologetics. So I kind of took the five views from that. Um, but that it's kind of an interesting way that they lay out the land. So they basically give these five classical apologetics, evidentialist apologetics, cumulative case, reformed epistemology, and then presuppositional apologetics, which is what we're talking about today. Um, however, the first three, are really similar. Um, so classical apologetics, evidentialist, and cumulative case. And really all three of these arguments, they're really focusing on giving some kind of evidence or arguments for God's existence. So the supposed difference between classical and evidential apologetics, at least according to this book, I'm not sure how standard this terminology is, but the, the difference supposedly is that classical apologetics starts with theism. So people like William Lane Craig, um, I think often do this, give some arguments to sh try to show that God exists, like the cosmological argument, the fine tuning argument. And then, okay, you believe God exists. Okay, now let's move to Christianity. Here's some arguments that Christianity is true. And then supposedly the evidentialist um, either switches that order or really just, <laughs> I mean, it, the second part wouldn't be that hard once you establish that Christianity is true, it just falls out of that, that God exists. But they kind of go with this Christ, more Christianity first approach. Again, not sure that this is the way everyone uses these terms, but this is how they use them in the book. Um, and then the cumulative case view would, I mean, it's similar, right? They just look at a bunch of different arguments and kind of build them together. Uh, and I actually think this is kind of a cool strategy, like looking at all these different arguments for God, not putting all your weight on one or two arguments, but kind of saying, look at, look at all these different arguments for this conclusion. You can do a lot of probability raising that way. 
Um, the other kind of apologetics that I don't really know fits exactly here, but it's reformed epistemology. Maybe I'll just mention this just because it will come up later. But reformed epistemology is basically the view that belief in God can be rational without being able to state an explicit argument for God's existence or without being based on an argument. So, you know, your grandma that goes to church every week and um, prays for you every night before she goes to bed, she doesn't have to know about the cosmological argument in order to be rational and believing in God. That's not actually a, po like, that's, you could be a classical apologist and agree with that. You could be an evidential apologist and agree with that. So I think it's just this other perspective and it's more of an epistemological claim than anything yeah. else. Um, but that is one of kind of the methods in the book. So this kind of contrasts with this presuppositional method. Um, and like you said, the basic idea he here is that we have to presuppose not just theism, but Christian theism in order to make sense of the universe. Um, but I, what I will say kind of to their credit is transcendental arguments are definitely like a thing in philosophy and Kant is actually super famous uh, for giving a transcendental argument, super widely discussed, like one of the most famous arguments in history of philosophy. Transcendental arguments basically go like this. X is a necessary condition for the possibility of Y. So for Y to be possible, you have to have X. Y is the case, therefore X. Um, so it's this kind of specific style of argument. And then what the precepts do is they basically say, okay, God, is a necessary condition for the possibility of, and then they fill in the things you were talking about, logic, morality, knowledge, defeating skepticism, you know, whatever. And then they say, look, we use logic. Logic is important. Morality is important. Um, these things are real. They're not just social constructs or whatever. Uh, and so therefore God exists. So what's interesting is that this is an argument for God, right? It's not, <laughs> I mean, it's not like it's, in some ways, you could say this is an argument for Christianity or for theism, right? Um, but they are very, at least from my impression, you can tell me if you think this is right, they seem to not really be into the other arguments. Like they really are stuck, like this is the argument that we use, and we don't really want to use the cosmological or ontological arguments uh, because, you know, for, for various reasons that we'll get into, but, you know, right. human reason, it's not, a, it's putting you on the judgment seat rather than God, etc. Um, and so the other thing, so it seems like they really say this and only this argument, <laughs> this transcendental argument. Right. And, you know, I think they could maybe affirm reformed epistemology, but I think they would have a very specific version of it where really the only thing that's properly basic is like the Bible or something. Um, so I think they, they want to resist at least the video. The one video that I watched, I watched a pretty long video with um, two guys talking about it. And they were saying they didn't want other things to be properly basic. So really it was like the Bible. That was what could be properly basic. But like that there's a cup on the table that couldn't be properly basic. Um, I don't even know if they would want to say like theism could be properly basic. They really want to start with the Bible. So <laughs> anyway, does that seem right? Uh, yeah, so what I would say, um, so I mean, this is part of the miscon. So what, we'll go ahead and just go into like common misconceptions about presuppositional. So one, precepts don't like evidence for God. This is a very common objection. They actually do. God has given us wonderful evidences Evidences are a wonderful gift from God for Christians to bolster our faith. Christians, we love the evidence for the existence of God. But they don't think we should give evidence to try and prove God when a non-believer already believes he exists. Now, when you're talking about, like, uh, you know, what is evidence, uh, you, you yourself would say that, like, the transcendental argument would be evidence. And the, the key thing that, uh, to be clear, is that their, their goal is not to... Uh, you know, convince the person that there is a God because they already, you know, they already believe in a God. Um, the the key thing is that you you're trying to get them to realize that there's a God. So you're not, um, you know, they would they would at least the, the way their the approach goes is that they're trying to not conclude that God exists because they they've already presupposed it. Like there's no reason to conclude it if they presupposed it. What they're concluding is that. You know, we have morality, this, that, and this, and um, the only way that works is if God is first. If, 
And, you know, we'll go into that. Um, does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay. Great. Another misconception is that precepts don't think non-Christians can reason correctly. This is something that there's debate on in the presuppositional community. Some think they can reason correctly, but only because God is the justification for logic and reason. Others think the unbeliever is totally depraved and unable to use reason to conclude God exists. The precept would never say God can't use another apologetic method to save someone, but they do think it's unbiblical to do so. A short summation of presuppositional apologetics that I like would be this. God is not the God you reason to. He is the God you can't reason without. Liz, can you talk about the importance of what method you choose to evangelize, whether it be traditional apologetics, presuppositional apologetics, and others? Is it about finding truth? Should we just choose the most effective method? What do you think we should focus on? Yeah, so I definitely think finding truth is a very important goal. Um, and in a way, like, Jesus is the Logos, right? So <laughs> Jesus is the truth. Um, and I think, you know, it's one that everyone, even presuppositional people, would share. So I think focusing on the truth and wanting to find the truth and even non-Christians, you know, say this, like the truth should be our goal. Um, right. So I, I totally agree with that. Um, but I do think, and maybe we'll talk about this more at the end as well, but like the most effective method in general is just going to depend on the person and depend on the situation. And some people are very inquisitive. They have tons of questions. They're very intellectual. Some people just really have this emotional barrier. Some people, it might be both, you know, um, there could be other barriers as well. And so I think the folks, the most effective method in general is just going to depend on the person and the situation. But what I'm wary of is methods that say, this is the only way to do it, or this is the only kind of argument that is biblical. And it seems like to an extent, precepts kind of say that. I mean, you're right that obviously they're okay with evidence, but they it seems like they want to say at least certain styles of giving arguments or certain kinds of you know arguments for theism or arguments for Christianity just aren't aren't biblical. Um, yeah. And so that's that's to me that's a little that at least seems wrong because it seems like the method we use is going to depend on the situation, and I don't want to just say. This is the only method and nothing else is good or nothing else is going to yeah. work. So. All right. A big complaint of giving evidence for a generic God like the Kalam or moral argument does is that it doesn't get used to the Christian God. In response to traditional apologetics, Sides and Bruden Kate once said, Anthony Flew was known as the world's most notorious atheist. He became a deist. This is what success looks like when you give the unbeliever evidence. You get deists. Big deal. This is not success. You might have a lot of deists walking this earth that Christians are slapping them on the back because they say there is a God. You know who else believes there's a God? Satan. He doesn't only believe there's a God, he believes in the God. It's not helping him any. Liz, do you not see an issue with arguing for a God that isn't specifically Christian? Yeah, I mean, I want to be as charitable as possible to, to people with this position. Um, but that said, I, I guess I just don't really see the problem here. Um, I think believing in God is a part of becoming a Christian. Mm -hmm. um, so let me think if I can give like, I should have come up with an analogy beforehand, but maybe um, it's like seeing that someone's blood is at a crime scene is a part of coming to realize that they committed the crime. So maybe your ultimate goal is trying to convince a jury that Smith committed a crime, but in order to do that, you're gonna start with maybe a weaker claim, which is that their blood was at the crime scene or something. Um, so yeah, of course we want people to become Christians, right? No one's di disputing that. But right. I do think sometimes you have to take people through steps of arguments and I, I was just listening to um, a YouTube video earlier and they were talking about sometimes people just go way too quickly, way too fast. And they're like, it's really hard to understand how physical things could think. So dualism is true. And it's like, they just jump into like, we all have souls when it's like, what if we just like, you know, have a weaker conclusion and then we can start from that conclusion mm. and then slowly build to an even strong, you know? And so I think like, I mean, look, I guess first of all, I'll say I'm all for arguments for Christianity, and I think that's great, and I think those convince some people. But I think at the same time, I guess what I'm trying to argue for is pluralism here. Sometimes we need to just get someone to the place where they think 
someone created all this and that's it, you know? And then we can work from that to, well, if God exists, then Christianity is true or Christianity is the most likely religion or whatever. But I do think, um, I mean, both for psychological reasons, some people just aren't ready to jump in and maybe they're just more open to thinking maybe there's a God. Um, But even for philosophical reasons, which is, it puts a lot of burden on your premises, the more, the more, the stronger your conclusion is. And sometimes it's weaker to argue for, or sorry, easier to argue for a weaker conclusion and then slowly build on that. So I think both of these re- reasons are reasons that I think it's totally fine to start with some arguments for God's existence and then build on that to arguments for Christianity. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I would say um, something also to add would be like, uh, I was talking with my friend the other day and he's like, hey, this is Zach. And, you know, if, if we're talking to someone else about me and, and then they, all they know is Zach, like they just, they think of some random human, like they don't think of anyone. And this would be analogous, analogous to like the moral argument, like you're talking about a God, like not a Christian God, not any specific God or Hindu God or whatever. We're talking about just a God in general. And then and then when we, you know, give more details, oh, this is my friend, Zach, he is, you know, he's blonde and he has a black shirt. Like that gives you more specifics about, you know, what that person or the other analogous cases who got is. And I think that's just like how we think, you know? Like, yeah. And, and I like that analogy too, because it, it shows that like what our ultimate goal is, is to get to know God, like in a personal way, Mm. but you're totally right. That when we get to know other people at first, we kind of just like know that like this person named Zach exists. And that's like, really, I don't even really know much about Zach. And then it's like, okay, Zach is into playing Xbox. Zach has blonde hair. Zach, you know, has a cool YouTube channel. And then as you get to know them better, you sort of fill out that picture of who they are. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I totally agree. It's not, it's normally not like you just jump in the deep end and you learn everything about someone all at once, but yeah, it's kind of this process. So I like Mm -hmm. that analogy. Awesome. It seems like some non-Christians just don't want to accept Christianity. A big knock on traditional and classical apologetics is that giving evidence is a waste of time if you don't deal with the presuppositions first. Cited in Bruden Kate gives them knowledge. This is a story, I'm sure many of you heard it already, but a man who thought he was dead. He thought he was dead, and it really upset his family because this guy in his house thought he was dead. And they tried every argument they could to convince this guy that he was not dead. Nothing worked. And they thought, okay, we'll take him to a medical doctor. A medical doctor will be able to convince this man that he's not dead. So they take him to a medical doctor, and the doctor thinks for a bit and goes, hmm, do dead men bleed? And the guy thought for a minute, he said, uh, no, their hearts aren't pumping. There's no blood going through their veins. Oh, dead men don't bleed. Doctor took out a pin, stuck him in the finger. Blood starts coming out. The guy goes, well, what do you know? Dead men do bleed. (laughs) So while funny, I think this shows an important thing, which is that people just have presuppositions. And unless you deal with those first, you're not going to get to, you're not going to break through with them. So Liz, why should we give evidence to non-Christians when we haven't dealt with their presuppositions first? I mean, I guess I'll say, first of all, I'm not saying that it's, there's never a place for transcendental arguments or there's never a place to show people that they're presupposing certain things. I mean, I'm not convinced that at least the specific transcendental arguments that we've talked about are super, super strong. Um, but I'm not saying like we could never use those or those have no place. Um, I'm just making a claim about some cases. And I think in some cases, people have genuine intellectual barriers to accepting Christianity or theism. Um, People genuinely, I mean, genuinely do not understand why an all good, all powerful God would allow evil. People genuinely don't understand why God seems so hidden to them. Um, you know, these types of questions or even questions about specific passages in scripture. That's another intellectual barrier um, that I've been, you know, talking about with friends lately and one that I experienced a lot in my own life. And I think it's not fair to say, oh, all of those just come down to you not wanting God to exist and being biased against Christianity. I just think, no, sometimes people have objections and we need to show them these good answers that Christian philosophers have, have come up with. Um, to help them see there are good reasons to believe Christianity. There are good support 
for Christianity. And we have things to say about things like the problem of evil and the problem of divine hiddenness. So, I mean, I think maybe that's just a starting point. For, I don't, I just think to say there's never any intellectual barriers to Christianity just seems totally wrong to me. That doesn't mean that there can't also be emotional barriers that our desires don't matter at all. Of course, those things matter too. And in a lot of cases, again, I'm going to talk about this later. I think our desires matter, our emotions matter. I think all of that matters in the grand scheme of things. But I think there's a time and place to sit down with someone and address the intellectual barriers they have to accepting Christianity. Um, so I like, I, I kind of said this already, but Christianity is not just a belief, it's a commitment, right? When you're a Christian, you're not just saying, I believe these things, you're saying, I'm committing my life to them. And so because of that, these emotions and these desires and all of that matters, but so do your beliefs, right? Um, if you have emotions and desires for your spouse, but you like believe that they're this terrible person and not a good spouse, it's like, okay, <laughs> it's not going to be the best marriage, even if you still desire to be with them and have all these emotions. And I think in the same way, the intellectual component is a really important co component of a Christian commitment, even though desire and emotion are also um, important. So. Right. And of course, the presuppositionalists, like all throughout that would be like, oh, well, they already know they believe in God or they already believe in God. They just they're just suppressing it in unright unrighteousness, which, of course, that goes back to, you know, just how we read the Bible. So, like, um, I mean, you know, people disagree on, you know, how we read the Bible sometimes. Well, can I just okay. say one last thing? I know we're yeah. I keep going long on questions. I, know you're fine. I also think whether you are already believe that God exists or that Christianity is true or you don't is really neither here nor there in this case, because evidence can both help us form a new belief or help us see like, oh, I really do believe that thing. Think, think hmm. back to the case where you're in love with your best friend and your friend's like, you're hanging out with him all the time. You're constantly texting him. You guys are together 24 seven. You're in love with him. What they're doing, like, it's something you are, that already is true of you. You already you know, have that mental state and your friend is bringing it out by giving you evidence. So I think it doesn't, it's, you know, I think this idea that there are genuinely intellectual barriers, giving people evidence to help them overcome intellectual barriers can both help them form a new belief, but also help them see a suppressed belief. So I think, you know, mm. either way. Yeah. Place for these arguments and evidence that I think go beyond just like a presuppositional transcendental argument. Yeah. yeah. That's very interesting. I like that. Cool. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sorry I talked right. so much. <laughs> uh, no, no, you, this is a, uh, this is why you're here to talk. <laughs> All right. Um, so a big issue presuppositionalists find with the classical and traditional apologetics is it puts the non-Christian in the seat to essentially decide for themselves if God exists. One would say. Out in the world, where do you hear evidence most often? In court. Who do you give evidence to in court? The judge. The judge and the jury. So we go out in the street, in a campus, with some arrogant, snot-nosed kids like that, and they say, I don't believe in God. And what's the first thing we do? We give them evidence. And when we give them evidence, who are we saying is the judge? Them. them. And who is on trial? God. God. So we go out in the street and we say, you, sir, are the judge. The Lord of glory is on trial. Wow. What the scriptures say, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And what are we doing? We're out there saying that God's on trial. That's right. Wow. Mm -hmm. And you know what the problem with that is? You can win that court case because God has given us wonderful evidences. Evidences are a wonderful gift from God for Christians to bolster our faith. You can win that court case and you can acquit God. But what's the problem? Who's the judge? Evidence for God. Evidence that demands a verdict. Who's the judge in this case? Not the creator of the universe, the unbeliever. These people know that God exists. So instead of believing what the Bible says, we believe them when they say that they don't believe that God exists. We elevate them to the position of judge and we put God on trial. Do you have any thoughts on that? Do you think it's right for us to encourage an atheist or agnostic to judge if God exists? Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think it's like inevitable, no matter what apologetic method we're using, that we have to use our own minds to gather and weigh evidence. 
Um, whether you're only using transcendental arguments, whether you're doing a more classical approach, whether you're arguing for Christianity, you have to gather and weigh evidence using your own mind. Even if, take the most direct situation, you know, and this happens in the Bible, God or an angel appears to someone and speaks to them directly and tells them something. Um, even in that case, we're still forming beliefs using our own mind on the basis of some evidence. In this case, that evidence is divine testimony. And we could choose to be skeptical of that. And people in the Bible even do this. Like God's like, Abraham, you're going to, your wife's going to bear a child. And Abraham's like, what? No way. You know? So it's like, even in the case of direct divine testimony, you're still using your own brain to gather and weigh evidence. Right? So I guess I just don't think we can step out of our own minds and do this in a different way. We have to make these kind of judgments. It's, it's unavoidable. Um, and I, I, I guess it just doesn't, I don't see when they say this is like putting you above God or it's making the atheist or agnostic the judge. I mean, I guess I just don't really see why or, or see that that's problematic. I, I don't, to me, it just, it's just how we, we weigh evidence. That's just what we're designed to do as rational beings made in God's image. Um, but I think even setting that aside, we can't help it. We have to use our own minds to gather and weigh evidence uh, in almost every single, I mean, it, it literally in every single case of getting evidence and forming a belief. Um, and I think the other thing that I, I want to note here too, is that pre presuppositional people, they're giving their own arguments for God's existence. They're transcendental arguments. They have premises and they have a conclusion. These are arguments that people can can argue against, give objections to, you can respond on behalf of. And so they are, they're giving arguments, they're giving evidence. So I guess it's not clear to me that they're not in a way doing the same thing. It's this very specific style of transcendental argument, but it still seems like, so I could object to a presuppositional argument and say, um, God is an unnecessary precondition for morality because I could be an atheist Platonist about morality, right? Or I could say truth is correspondence to the world. So I don't need to presuppose God in order to understand truth. And then they could come back and say why I'm wrong. But again, what we're doing is we're using our, our minds to think through these issues and to think through an argument. And so I guess I don't see that as problematic, but even if it is problematic, we can't get around it, you know? Yeah. Uh, just uh, just for the people that are um, not as familiar with the topic, uh, mm -hmm. could you briefly talk about like why you know things like Platonism or what was the other one you you mentioned? The the correspondence theory of truth. Yeah, like why is that relevant in this? Well, yeah. So one of the like does it contradict? Well, yeah. So okay. So one of the premises of the presuppositional argument is that God is a necessary condition for the possibility of. And then two of those things were truth and morality. And I'm just not totally convinced that God is a necessary condition for the possibility of those things. So, you know, to take just morality, for example, um, tons and tons of atheists believe in what's called abstract objects. This is called Platonism. So, uh, you know, it's true that two plus two equals four, but how do we explain that? What makes that true? Where is the number two? And it's not like you can go travel to some faraway country and find number two. So abstract mm -hmm. objects are these spaceless, um, like non-temporal objects um, that ground certain statements. Some people think propositions are abstract objects. So I could utter snow is white in English or I'm not going to try, but I could utter snow is white in Spanish. I used to speak Spanish and I like lost it all. Um, and that both of those strings of words utter the same idea. They express the same idea, snow is white. So the idea is that there's some non-linguistic uh, thing that's expressible by language, but that thing is not a physical thing you can go see. Here's the proposition, snow is white. So again, it's an abstract object. So I'm not here to defend Platonism. I'm just trying to explain the view and say why I think some atheists won't be convinced that God is a necessary precondition for morality, because they'll say it's also true in the same way there's a proposition snow is white, there's a proposition that torturing babies for fun is morally wrong and helping the old lady across the street is a good thing. And so these 
these ground our moral claims. So morality is totally objective. It applies to all people at all times. And it exists in this platonic realm alongside the numbers and the propositions. And, you know, I think that's weird. Um, I'm, I'm not a Platonist in that sense. I'm a, I'm a Platonist in the sense that I do want to ground those things in God. But the point is just that you can push back here, right? And you can argue about these premises. And I know they only want to give these really specific presuppositional transcendental arguments. But the point is just that, like, it's not obvious that there aren't ways to object to these arguments. And then once we start objecting and going back and forth, we're, we're, we're making a judgment about the arguments and whether they're good arguments or not. So, so I just don't see how the presuppositional person is going to get out of this number one. And then number two, I think these arguments are interesting, but they're very controversial, very objectionable, and lots of objections can be raised to them. When, when you say controversial, do you mean like just people in general, like philosophers, like, and specifically like Christians? Uh, I know William Lane Craig is like a nominalist. Is that, is that it? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And, nominalist. Yes. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, no, you can work. No, I was just gonna say nominalists are, are people that don't believe in abstract objects. Um, but yeah, Christians are all over the map on abstract objects. So some are nominalists. Um, Peter Van Inwagen is like a Platonist. So he thinks that both God and abstract objects just are necessary existence. Um, and then there's a view in the middle, which you can argue about whether you should call it Platonism, but it's kind of like a version of Platonism where the abstract objects are are grounded in God and God's mind or God's nature or something like that. So I think a lot of philosophers in this camp like to say morality is determined by God's nature and then maybe uh, propositions and maybe facts about possibilities are somehow determined by God's thoughts or something. So there's different ways you can go and there's actually a ton of work going into how to spell this out exactly. But the point is that Christian philosophers have em embraced all three of these and it's not obvious that to be a genuine christian you have to think that god's a, a necessary uh, precondition for truth or morality and even stronger obviously tons and tons of atheists are going to say no i'm just an atheist platonist um and not be convinced that in order to understand morality you have to posit the christian god so i guess like i just think that premise is both controversial among Christians, but also will just be controversial in general among among everyone. I don't think mm -hmm. people are just going to say, oh, yeah, that's obviously true. You have to presuppose God to understand morality. I think a lot of people are going to say, no, you don't, <laughs> you know, um, in the same way the moral argument is controversial. And I mean, I might be talking crazy, but I mean, if, if you were to take the presuppositional approach and use that as a method, uh, I mean, do you think that it would be smart to like really just like look into all that to, you know to you know to verify that oh these this presuppositional approach is like logically valid like is it is it good like should we use it or do we should we like you know should that person maybe just trust the experts on it or what do you think yeah that's a good question i mean it would be interesting to yeah to hear all the ways that this I that the, these transcendental arguments are defended by presuppositionalists like what kind of reasons do they use to defend that morality or sorry that God is a preconception for the possibility of morality um so so I think it'll depend on all the reasons that they're giving for that then we can kind of evaluate those reasons for and against I'm just saying to me that's not obviously true um, but I do think, I mean, so this is just maybe Liz speaking, like, so in my view, as Liz speaking, I do think God is the best explanation, um, like grounding abstract objects in God, I think is, is the best explanation for them. So I do think it's kind of spooky to say they just exist by themselves. And I think it's also unclear, like why we should care about these abstract objects. Like if they're saying like torturing babies for fun is wrong, like that doesn't seem to give this like motivational force that it would if it's um, grounded in God's nature. But it's like, I'm just trying to understand, like, is that the presuppositionalist point? Like, I feel like that isn't. It's not like, oh, there's these abstract objects and like, it makes 
you know, it's like, it makes the most sense if they're grounded in God. I mean, maybe it is. And if so, I think that's like an interesting argument for God's existence. Um, but maybe they're taking that and then they're adding a bunch of other stuff to it, which is like, and you have to presuppose this in order to like make sense of the world and have knowledge and do all this other stuff. And so then that means you really actually do believe in the Christian God. And I think a lot of that stuff I wouldn't agree with, but I do think there's kind of an interesting connection and maybe argument like from abstract objects to God. So, so, you know, it's not like it's all bad or I disagree with it all. Um, but, but yeah, I think maybe I would, I would take that and tweak it a little bit, but I, I do think that's a really interesting argument. Okay. Let's continue. Possibly presuppositionalism's greatest popularizer was Greg Bonson, who said, The presuppositional challenge to the unbeliever is guided by the premise that only the Christian worldview provides the philosophical preconditions necessary for man's reasoning and knowledge whatever. From beginning to end, man's reasoning about anything whatsoever, even reasoning about reasoning itself, is unintelligible or incoherent unless the truth of Christian scripture is presupposed. Would you agree with that? Yeah, so I think, um, and this came up actually in that video I was watching, you can kind of divide this claim into two claims. So claim one is like a metaphysical claim, which is that if God doesn't actually exist in the world, so if God doesn't exist, then we couldn't have reason or knowledge. So in a world with no God, no one could reason, no one could know anything. That's the metaphysical claim. The epistemological claim is would say that one must believe in or know that God exists in order to have reason or knowledge. So it's not a claim about the world that we have to be in a theistic world, but it's like one needs to believe in God in order to have reason or knowledge. So it's like a claim about your mind. So it's an epistemological claim. Um, however, I guess both of these just seem false to me. Um, so I, I don't think atheism leads to skepticism. So first of all, if we live in a world without God, there's no God, I don't see why I couldn't know like that there's a cup on this table, right? <laughs> um, it seems like I could perceive the cup and come to know that there's a cup based on, you know, having this justified, true, ungettered belief that there's a cup on the table. Um, I also don't think I have to believe in God or know that God exists in order to have knowledge, um, kind of for the same reason, I think. I mean, I guess presuppositionalists would say everyone deep down knows that God exists. So maybe everyone can have normal knowledge, but it's only due to this deep down belief. But take a creature that doesn't have that belief, whether that's, you know, there's no one that actually is an atheist or whatever. I just don't see why they, they couldn't know things. Um, so you know, I think children know things. I think animals know things. Children know things like this is my parent or this is my favorite food or, you know, I, I love breast milk, whatever, you know, um, and animals know things. Animals know um, I'm hungry or we're about to go on a walk. And I, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know that animals believe in God, but I think they can know things. I think children can know things as well. So I guess <laughs> You know, I, I want to be as charitable as possible, but I'm just not seeing a way to make this true that God is the precondition for intelligible experience and knowledge, especially if you adopt an epistemology that's just not a skeptical one. And tons and tons of work has been done recently on what's called like common sense epistemology, which is like we can give an epistemology that make sense of the fact that most of our everyday beliefs are justified. And I don't think that it all depends on either God existing or someone, the believers knowing or believing in God. All right. Uh, could you explain like what, how you would define knowledge? Uh, what does it take? Is it just justified true belief? Like, it, like I would assume there is debate about that, right? Yeah, for sure. So defining knowledge is controversial. Although I do think almost everyone thinks that knowledge involves um, so belief. So if you know something, you believe that it's true. Um, it involves the thing actually being true. So you can't know that it's going to rain tomorrow if it doesn't rain tomorrow. Um, and then it involves justification, which means you have a good basis. So if you like shake a magic eight ball, is it going to rain tomorrow? And the magic eight ball says yes, but just by luck, the magic eight ball is right. That's not knowledge. You have a true belief, but you're, you don't have justification. You don't have a good basis for it. Um, so almost all epistemologists think knowledge is justified true belief. 
and uh, at least it, it requires those three things. But then, I mean, we don't need to get into all of this. This could be a, a topic of a whole nother interview. Edmund Gettier, this philosopher came along and gave right. cases of justified true belief that aren't knowledge. So I'll just give one really quickly. Um, you've worked at the same place for 10 years. The you know cleaning staff has always reliably uh, replaced the batteries and the clocks. So the clocks are always very accurate. Um, so you have very good reason to trust the clock in your office. It's been accurate for 10 years. And you walk in one day, you see that the clock says 9 a.m. And so you believe it's 9 a.m. And this is a really interesting case because it's actually a case where the clock has stopped. Um, so the clock stopped at 9 a.m. maybe that, that night, let's say. Uh, so the clock is at nine o'clock, but it's not actually a reliable clock. But by luck, you just happen to walk in at exactly 9 a.m. where the clock stopped. So your belief is like kind of you have a justified belief that's you get unlucky because the clock stopped, but then you get lucky because you actually walk in right at the time. So this is supposed to be a justified true belief that isn't knowledge. Um, it's true. It's a belief and it's justified because you have this track record of the clock always being reliable. So you have a good basis. So anyway, um, a lot of people want to add a fourth condition for knowledge. There's huge debate about what that condition is, but, um, you know, a lot of people think it has something to do with the environment um, that the belief is formed in or that, you know, luck not being involved in the belief in a certain way. So we could, you know, talk again, a whole video about how to cash that out. But the, the kind of most common way that epistemologists define knowledge now is it's justified, true, ungettiered belief, where ungettiered is like it's not based on luck or this envi this weird environmental gettier thing hasn't happened. Um, I have some other videos where I talk more about that, or even if you just look on YouTube and type in the gettier problem, there's videos about this. So you can look more into like that debate in the various theories. Yeah. Cool. Uh, as a professional epistemologist, could you possibly expand on what epistemology is and ontology is, and what kind of epistemological and ontological claims are being made here? Many presuppositionalists would say you can't do one without the other. You can't do epistemology without ontology and vice versa. Would you agree or disagree? Yeah. Uh, um, so a common, yeah, a common distinction is between, so epistemology is the study of knowledge and justified belief. Um, knowledge and belief, these involve mental states, so they often involve things that are kind of going on in our heads. At least that's a lot of what epistemologists think about. So what makes my belief that it will rain tomorrow justified? Um, what makes that belief irrational? If it's evidence, what is evidence? You know, these are all questions in epistemology. So it's this very like mental thing. Whereas ontology, um, and you could also put metaphysics in here as well, ontology is the study of existence. So what exists, what doesn't exist. Metaphysics is the study of ultimate reality. So ontology is a uh, branch of metaphysics. So, you know, if I have a justified belief that it will rain tomorrow, but it actually is sunny tomorrow, then in a way the epistemology and the ontology or the metaphysics are coming apart. At least what's true in the world is that it's sunny tomorrow, but I have maybe I have a bunch of evidence. Maybe the forecast is wrong and I check the forecast and it's like, oh, it's, uh, it's predicted that there's a 90% chance of rain tomorrow. Then I have a justified belief that it will rain tomorrow, even though like what happens out there in the world, <laughs> it, it, it's sunny. Um, so, you know, I think, yeah, I, I it is kind of hard to understand because it's like they kind of want to say, so is God, when you say God is the precondition for morality or for truth or whatever, are you saying that that's like the epistemological claim that it's like belief in God? Or is it this metaphysical claim like that God actually exists? And what I heard at least one of the people say is that when you know something, and this is, this is totally correct. When you know something, not only does that involve something in your head, that also involves something being true in the world. That's what we mean when we say knowledge is factive. Knowledge attaches us to facts. So if you know P, P has to be true. If you know it'll rain tomorrow, it has to rain tomorrow. If you know there's a cup on the table, there has to be a cup on the table. And if you know you don't change anything except for you take the cup off the table, then you can't no, any longer know that there's a cup on the table because it's false, right? So knowledge does involve both what's going on in our heads and in the world. It's like this internal and this external thing. Um, 
but yeah, I still think, so maybe what they're trying to say is someone's knowing God exists is a precondition for morality or logic or whatever, you know? Um, and then, and then I guess like, yeah, that would be both an epistemological claim and an ontological claim. I still don't know if I would agree with that claim. Um, so, you know, maybe that's the best kind of interpretation of what they're trying to claim, but I definitely think, um, you know, beyond this idea that knowledge is factive, I'm not totally sure what the claim is. Because if you have a justified false belief, um, that's not factive, that's not going to have implications for the world. There's also lots of truths out there in the world that we don't know about, we've never discovered, or we just haven't heard of, so we don't have beliefs about them, right? So these things do come apart, so maybe they're just really honing in on knowledge, which does have this internal and this external component and trying to focus on that. Um, but I do think it's important to keep our epistemology and our metaphysics or ontology distinct. Uh, not to make you repeat yourself, but no. uh, what what could you briefly uh, say one more time, like why it's important to keep it distinct? Like what can that affect? Well, so I think there's two different claims. The first claim is you need to believe in God um, in order to you know, reason or make sense of morality or whatever. So, so this thing needs to be true in your head, right? Claim number two is God has to exist in order to, for us to be able to reason well or to make sense of morality or whatever, right? And so those are totally different claims because if God exists, but there's a bunch of atheists uh, in the world, then if the claim is just the metaphysical one, all those atheists can still reason well because God actually exists. Uh, the other claim would be one where it's like, let's say there is no God, but I believe in God. Well, if that claim is true, then I can still reason well because I believe in God, even though God doesn't actually exist in the world. So they're making different claims. One is a claim about what I believe. The other is a claim about mm. the world. And then my, I was trying to give like my best response on behalf of them. And what I think they're saying is, well, you have to have knowledge. And knowledge does involve both belief and something being true in the world. And so there's maybe what they're saying is it's both an epistemological claim and a claim about the world. Not only does it have to be true that God does exist, but you also have to have a justified true and get your belief <laughs> that God exists. So, it, you know, what this is interesting because it's actually, we have these two separate claims. It's combining both of them. So it's making it even harder <laughs> to have knowledge or to have morality or to have, you know, whatever this precondition is. Um, not only does God actually have to exist, but you have to know that God exists. So it's a pretty hot, dang high bar, which, as we were saying earlier, you know, the stronger the conclusion, the more robust your premises have to be to support that. So they're making now they're now making this really, really strong claim, and they're going to need to do a lot of work um to to support that people have to people have to know that god exists in order to make sense of truth and morality and all these other things so i think i think that's going to be difficult to argue um yeah <laughs> liz do you think we need absolute certainty to have knowledge and are you absolutely certain of that uh, so there is a debate about this and the terms that are often used is fallibilism versus infallibilism so infallibilism says that knowledge requires certainty or probability one um, or the thing you know like entails that the other thing is true with probability one. Basically knowledge requires certainty and then fallibilists say knowledge does not require certainty. Um, so I will say the view infallibilism, the view that knowledge requires certainty is um, not super widely held. <laughs> uh, it's pretty rare, partially because if knowledge requires absolute certainty, and note that when philosophers talk about certainty, they mean this very, very, very high standard. So according to a philosopher, I can't even be certain that there's a brown desk in front of me right now because I could be in the matrix. I could be dreaming. I could be a brain in a vat. So they look at these really far-fetched possibilities and they might say, yeah, you have really good evidence there's a brown table. You can believe there's a brown table. You can be very confident there's this brown table, but you can't be 100% absolutely certain because you can't rule out every possibility of dreaming or being in the matrix or whatever. And so if you're an infallibilist, 
you're saying knowledge has to have this super, super, super high standard. Um, maybe you could only know things like one plus one equals two or that you exist. Maybe you can't even know that. But either way, if knowledge requires certainty, there's going to be very little that we know. And so because of that, a lot of epistemologists are fallibilists. I'm also a fallibilist. Basically, the idea is that you don't need absolute certainty in order to know something. I can know that my car is parked in front of my house, even though I'm not absolutely certain. I literally drove it there like less than an hour ago. I have really good evidence for it. I can know there's a brown table in front of me, even though technically I could be in the matrix right now, you know? Um, so because infallibilism basically says all these things that we thought we could know we couldn't know, people reject it and usually go in for infallibilism. Okay, cool. Uh, so could you be wrong about everything you know? Without God, how could you even know you aren't a Brendan of that? How do you know you exist at all? When you say, I think, therefore I am, are you not assuming that you exist? Isn't it possible someone else is doing that thinking? No, I'm actually totally sympathetic to that. Um, so I think certainty is this super high bar. Remember, I think in English we'll say, oh yeah, I'm sure that the bus comes at 410. I'm certain that, the, you know, and that's not what we mean. We mean this thing that's like, I am, I literally could not be more sure. I am 100% sure. Um, and that sense of certainty, um, I think I'm pretty convinced we can't be certain of anything. We cannot be 100% sure. Um, yeah, I think, look, I think therefore I am. Uh, how do you know that there's an I doing the thinking? Why not just say there is a thought? This was Hume's objection to Descartes, right? Um, one plus one equals two, an evil demon could be deceiving you about the truths of math and logic. I mean, I do think it gets, okay, so the best ones I think are like, there is pain or something when you're in pain, you know, it's like yeah. you perceive this pain. I do think it's like, oh, could I really be wrong about that? Like, cause it seems like what it is to pain, to have pain is to, to sense that pain. So I don't think, I don't know that you could be wrong about you experiencing pain. So that's the best one, but I still think, I mean, on this, like even like the cogito and, and the truths of math and logic, I don't think that that is things, we probably can't be certain in the philosophical sense of those things. Um, so I think we can be certain about pretty much almost nothing. And it would be these like inner perceptions of like pain or like, it seems like there's something brown right there. Maybe we could be certain of that, I don't know. Um, that said, though, I think certainty is overrated. I don't know why people are so obsessed with it. Um, I just don't think it's this ultimate achievement that you are 100% certain of something because there's all these other great epistemic goods that you can have that don't require certainty. Again, knowledge, especially if we're fallibilists, most epistemologists are. Justified beliefs, beliefs that are based, you know, they're on a good basis. You have good evidence for them. You can have high confidence. You could have commitments. And I think commitment is actually really way more important than certainty. Um, you know, a lot of Christians struggle with doubts. A lot of Christians wonder, why does God allow this evil in my life? Why does God allow evil in general? We've already talked about this. And I think we shouldn't just stick our heads in the sand and ignore those doubts, but we should say, yeah, I'm in a place where I am not 100% certain that God exists and that's okay because I can continue in my commitment to God even despite not being certain. And I think this is not just true about God. I think this is true about tons of other commitments that we make, whether it's like you're questioning, am I cut out for this really hard graduate program or this really hard major? Or like, did I marry the right person? Or, you know, is this sport right for me? Or, you know, think about like New Year's resolutions, like even those, we get counter evidence. We're not certain we made the right choice. But that's okay because we can, as long as we're continuing in that commitment and letting our desires also play some role in deciding what we do, um, then I think that's okay. So sorry, I kind of went on a rant there. The main point is that I think certainty so, is overrated and I think commitment is the more important thing. That helps a lot. So Side and Burden Kate once asked a really good question. I say, let's say that somebody asked me the speed of the road outside the building where we're at now. And I said it was 40 miles per hour, but I could be wrong. Do I know it? No, I don't. If I told you, I think the speed limit is 50 miles per hour, but I could be wrong, would you say I know the speed limit of the road? I mean, I think this is a good question because like, it might be that the presuppositionalists are using a different sense of knowledge than our sense of knowledge in everyday life. But I do think every day we say that we know things, even though like there is this, you know, deep down there is this possibility that we could be wrong. You know, like I know 
there's a table in front of me. I know I have a meeting at four o'clock tomorrow. Um, even though like I could be in the matrix and like, there are no meetings in the matrix and much less tables, you know, whatever. Um, mm. so, so I think the way that, and I think one goal that some epistemologists, these common sense epistemologists have had recently is trying to capture this idea that we do know a lot of things. Knowledge is this common thing. And, and it does seem like knowledge, we, we get perceptual knowledge. When we tell other people things, we transmit knowledge from one person to another. I mean, knowledge, it's one of the most common words in English. I think it's in the top 10 most commonly used words. And it's actually one of the only words that's common to every single language. So knowledge is a really important thing. And there's a lot of evidence that it's a part of our everyday life and our everyday experience. And I'm wondering if presuppositionalists are just, they have a really high bar for knowledge. Like they think knowledge requires certainty. Um, and they also think, I think knowing anything requires assuming, requires knowing that the Christian God exists. And so maybe, I mean, you can raise the bar and that's fine. But then like, number one, um, are we even talking about the same thing anymore? But number two, I think it's it's just a lot harder to capture our everyday cases of knowledge. And let's take as a generic knowledge claim, the letter A. How do I know A? What's the answer? Well, because of B. How do I know I'm sitting here while my eyes are telling me? How do I know my eyes are working properly? Well, I went to an eye doctor and he checked them up. He gave me a good clean bill of health. So because of C. I know A because of B because of C. How do I know C? Well, because of D. How do I know D because of E? You know where that ends? Not at the end of the alphabet. It doesn't end. It's an infinite regress. I know A because of B because of C because of D on and on and on and on. So in order to know anything at all, you would have to have infinite knowledge. You would have to end that infinite regress. The only way to do that is with infinite knowledge. Who has infinite knowledge? I don't. You don't. Who has infinite knowledge? God has infinite knowledge. So in order to know anything at all, you would have to know everything or have a revelation from somebody who does. That is the Christian worldview. I say, if you reject that, then you cannot justify even one knowledge claim. Do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think I would actually just disagree with this idea that in order to know something, you have to know why you know it or how you know it. I just don't, I don't think that's true. Um, so we talked a little bit about this already, but I think children and animals know things. Um, I have an example from one of my papers where a child knows this is my father. And then someone says, well, how do you know that's your father? How do you know it's not a scary man dressed up like your father? Da, 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 da. And the child can't really answer the person. Uh, let's say it's a really young kid. They're like, oh, but like the child still knows it's his father, you know? Um, and I think animals, the same thing. Animals can't give you arguments animals can't give you long chains of reasoning but they know they're about to go on a walk or they know there's food in that bowl in front of them or they know that's that's my master or whatever um so i i think that children and animals know things and i think we can even know things without um going through this long chain of reasoning to justify the things that we believe or the things that we know um so there is a view in epistemology it's called infinitism and infinitism says that justified belief requires um, either an infinite number of beliefs or maybe like an infinitely long belief, like A and B and C and D and all the way infinitely. Um, but it's, it's a pretty unpopular view and almost no one defends it. Um, many epistemologists are foundationalists. They think there's some kind of foundation or starting point, uh, and then we can start there and sort of build our knowledge up from there. There's also coherentists who think that coherence between a set of beliefs gives justification. Um, so there's a lot of different views here, but I think I would, again, just deny this idea that in order to know something, you have to know why you know it. Um, I do think we can just, there are certain things we can just say, nope, I just know that and I don't have to give an argument for it. Gotcha. Liz, every time you answer, you use your own reasoning but you haven't given any justification for why your reasoning is valid in the first place. How do you know your reasoning is valid? Through your reasoning? Have you not presupposed your reasoning when responding? <laughs> yeah, I think this is actually a cool question because it gets into circularity. Circularity is a huge topic in epistemology. And um, I do want to plug the another YouTube channel. It's called The Analytic Christian. Um, Andrew Moon has several interviews on that channel about circularity, and he's going to go into a lot more detail than I'm able to hear. So if you're interested in this, you should go check that out. 
Um, but the basic idea is that to an extent, some level of circularity is unavoidable. You have to start reasoning somewhere. You have to trust your brain and your reasoning processes um, to make progress. So what I want to try to do is distinguish between different kinds of circularity, uh, some of which I think are, are fine and some of which are not good. Um, so this is one distinction that Andrew makes is between logical circularity and epistemic circularity. So logical circularity would be like this. You're like, well, what's a, why do you believe in God? Give me a reason to believe in God. And I say, well, look, God exists and God wrote the Bible and the Bible says that God exists. So God exists. There's an argument for you. <laughs> um, so this is actually a valid argument in the sense that if the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. But the premises, which, so it's kind of funny. It's like, you can't say it's invalid, right? But the premises don't give us an additional reason or additional support for the conclusion because one of the premises is the conclusion. So in this sense, this argument is a logically circular argument, um, and it's not going to be an argument that is going to be convincing for someone or give us a reason to believe the conclusion. So in that sense, it's, it's, it's problematic. <laughs> um, right. Okay. So there's logical circularity. Then there's what's called epistemic circularity. Epistemic circularity is about the reliability of some kind of reasoning process. So here is an example. Um, I remembered uh, X correctly two days ago. I remembered Y correctly last week. I remembered Z correctly last month. So because I have all these cases of correct memories, my memory is generally reliable but I'm actually using my memory <laughs> in order to give an argument that my memory is reliable. So I'm using that same process in order to argue that this process is reliable. So it's circular. Um, notice here, it's not just any proposition is in the conclusion. The conclusion is about the reliability of some reasoning process. That's why it's epistemic circularity, not yeah. just logical. And Mike Bergman has a really famous paper on epistemic circularity. It actually won a big prize. So really important, really famous paper. And he says there's two kinds of epistemic circularity. There's malignant epistemic circularity, which takes away our justification. Um, and so he, he gives this case that's kind of funny. You go up to a car salesman and you say, are, are, you, are you reliable? Can I trust you? And the car salesman's like, yes, definitely. You can absolutely trust me. I will never lie to you about cars. I'm super reliable. And then they're like, oh, okay. Well, if he says he's reliable, then I guess I can trust him. You know. <laughs> so obviously it's like this circular reasoning. And Bergman says, there's something fishy about this, right? We shouldn't go up to car salesmen and ask if they're reliable. And then if they say yes, believe them. Right. It seems like there's other cases of circularity that are what Bergman calls benign circularity. These are cases of epistemic circularity that don't take away justification. So the memory case would be one of these. Um, or generally just thinking that your brain or your mind is reliable when you're undergoing some kind of process of reasoning. And so basically what Bergman says is if you have some kind of independent reason to doubt a process. So in the car salesman case, you have kind of an independent reason to be suspicious of this car salesman, right? Then we should think that this epistemic circularity takes away justification. But if you don't have an independent reason to be suspicious of this reliable, the reliability of the process in question, then the circularity is benign. Um, so there again, check out Andrew's video, or if you're really nerding out on this, go check out Bergman's paper um, on epistemic circularity. But the idea is that almost, I would say almost all epistemologists agree, except for the most radical skeptics, that we have to have some epistemic circularity because we can't trust, we can't reason to the idea that our, our brains are reliable without using our brains, for example, right? So so this is a point that Plantinga makes. God actually has to use God's own mind in order to believe I'm omniscient or I am maximally reliable or whatever. So epistemic circularity actually even infects God. I don't think the fact that God has an infinite number of beliefs can help with this because God is still using God's own mind to think through these beliefs, right? So God <laughs> uses epistemically circular processes, right? <laughs> um, but two we have to start somewhere. We have to trust our brains when we evaluate even transcendental arguments. You know, we have to 
start with our own reasoning process. When, if God comes down and tells us this thing is true, we still have to trust that we're perceiving God correctly, that we're hearing the things that God is telling us correctly. We can't get out of our own heads. Um, so I just think there's no way to get out of this, no matter what epistemological method you're using. So I think, yeah, there is some circularity involved. We can talk about why logical circularity and malignant circularity aren't good and aren't trustworthy. But at the same time, everyone, even presuppositionalists themselves, are going to have to reason with some epistemic circularity. Yeah, so, I mean, it sounds like you'd say that you know, the presuppositional approach, because this is a common objection, that it uses circular reasoning so that we shouldn't listen to it or we shouldn't you know, adhere to this method. But it sounds like you're saying that we all have to use some type of circular reasoning and that that's not a bad reason to use the method. Uh, it's not always a bad reason. So an argument that is blatantly question begging, the one that I said, like, God exists, God wrote the Bible, so yeah. the Bible's valid, so God exists mm -hmm. or whatever, you know, I mean, that's logical circularity. And that's not a good argument, at least in the sense that it's not convincing. The premises don't give you additional reason to believe the conclusion. Um, however, yeah, I do think we all have to engage in some level of circularity where we rely on some process to establish that process's reliability, for example. Um, I also think too, I mean, yeah, it's like our precepts. So, it, so, so a common objection to presuppositionalism is that their argument is circular because they're like using the Bible to justify the Bible or something. Is that the thought? Yeah, so I guess I'd be good to recap the specific version of the transcendental argument for God that a lot of presuppositionalists use would go something like this. God is the precondition for the use of logic and morality. Everyone uses logic and morality, therefore everyone presupposes God when using logic and morality. Where the circular claim comes in is typically premise one, where it seems to many that God is being assumed without giving any evidence for it. And then, of course, it concludes with all humans believing in God, therefore appearing to be circular reasoning. I'm not, I don't think that transcendental arguments have to be circular. Um, a is a precondition for the possibility of B, B, therefore A, you know, I don't see why that in and of itself is circular in a problematic way. It's not question begging. It doesn't have the features of malignant circularity that Bergman talks hmm. about. So I, I don't see a problem with transcendental arguments in general. Well, good job. You know, you got brownie points from the precepts. <laughs> <laughs> so when looking for the most consistent and possibly the only consistent worldview, do you think we need to justify our ability to reason correctly before we can say we're reasoning correctly? Yeah, and I would say no. I think this is a case of um, something that it's okay to to presuppose or at least like you know, my reasoning process is generally reliable. And of course that doesn't mean it's always reliable. I'm really unreliable at seeing small objects really far away in the dark, right? My perception isn't reliable there. I'm really unreliable at like reading math papers published in peer reviewed journals super quickly, you know, like, right? So it doesn't mean like I trust my reasoning in every situation, no matter what, like math is super hard and takes forever to read um, for you to actually understand it well, right? But I do think presupposing that generally we're reliable in these basic ways, um, I think is totally fine. And I think even using that process to uh, come to believe that we're reliable is fine. So I think this would be a situation, at least the right kinds of processes, that's a situation of what's called benign circularity, a case where you can use your memory to uh, come to believe your memory is reliable, or you can use, um, you know, your perception to believe your perception is reliable. You've written in peer-reviewed journals on the biblical view of faith. Can you explain to the audience what that is? Definitely. So I've sort of hinted at this a little bit already, but on my view, faith is a kind of commitment. Um, and part of the function of faith is it helps us keep our commitments over time. So faith involves some kind of belief-like component and some kind of desire-like component. So maybe I'll give a couple examples. Um, like if I have faith that, uh, you know, my favorite hockey team is going to win their game tonight, I both believe or think it's likely that they're going to win. So if I think it's almost for sure they're going to lose, then I don't have faith. Um, but I also want them to win. I have a strong desire for them to win. I'm on their team. I'm cheering for them. I'm, I'm pro, you know, pro this 
this hockey team, right? So, um, so that's what I mean when I say it has a belief-like component and a desire-like component. And then I also have a commitment to this team. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm living my life as a fan, you know, that's kind of my commitment to them. And, um, you know, maybe someone in their one of their starting players get, gets injured. So I get some counter evidence that they're going to win tonight. But because I have that commitment, my faith in that team helps me to remain steadfast and still cheer for them and still have faith they're going to win. Um, you know, if you get too much counter evidence, you should give up your faith. So if they're down, uh, you know, five points with one minute left or something, it's kind of like, okay, yeah, they're probably not going to win this game. And then you should give up at least their faith that your faith that they're going to win the game. You don't have to give up your faith in the team because your commitment to them goes beyond them just winning that one game, but you should give up your faith that they're going to win that particular game. And I think faith in God is, is similar to this. I think it involves a belief-like component and a desire-like component. So you either believe that God exists, you think it's likely that God exists, you have confidence that God exists. And I also think on some level you want God to exist or you think that God's existence would be a good thing. And um, faith in God also involves this, this commitment to God and it helps us remain steadfast even when we have doubts. Like we could doubt that God's good. We could doubt that God really exists because of the problem of evil or problem of divine hiddenness. Um, we could just be not feeling it someday, you know? Um, and our faith helps us remain steadfast even in light of those obstacles. Yeah, okay. So we've talked about the presuppositional approach to witnessing with non-Christians. Some will probably completely disagree with some of the ideas you've mentioned, and others may think you have some ideas worth pursuing further. As a God-fearing Christian who wants to fulfill the Great Commission, can you talk about what your general approach is when witnessing to non-believers? This is a great question to kind of end with, and it's kind of practical too. So I think the first thing I would say uh, is just like listening to them and kind of hearing them out, getting to know them, treating them like a person, not a project. Um, really just genuinely taking interest in them and, and getting to know them. Uh, and I think too, sharing your own story can be really valuable here as well, because some people sort of open up better when you open up first, but I also think people love to talk about themselves. So listening to them, letting them talk, kind of hearing where they're at, hearing about their life and their experiences is I think kind of the number one place to start. And sometimes that might be all you do. You know, sometimes you might just sit and talk with someone and, and hear about their story and, and kind of leave it at that, you know? Um, so I don't, I think don't jump into here's the cosmological argument if they're not ready to hear that, you know? And so you kind of, again, like we said this earlier, you kind of have to take it case by case. You have to think about the person, you have to think about the circumstance. And as you get to know someone, maybe you shouldn't bring evidence in immediately, but maybe you could do it later, you know? Yeah. So you, you got to use some discernment and wisdom in this, I think. Um, but yeah, I do think there's a place for giving evidence, giving evidence that God exists, giving evidence that Christianity is true. Um, and I think sometimes just getting someone to acknowledge the possibility and to think about the possibility is a really good place to start. So I don't think that you should feel like you have to convince them to believe that God exists or believe Christianity is true right away, especially if they're very skeptical. Sometimes you might just want to get them starting to think about this is possible. Like, could this be true? And really focusing on and thinking about that possibility. Um, another kind of piece of advice on, on this point, this is kind of the more epistemic point, is I think you should do your best to answer their doubts and objections. But also a thing I've seen people do that I think really just harms more than it helps is trying to make up an answer or give an answer when you don't really know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, and I think in those cases, it's okay to admit that you don't have an answer. You can say you're going to look into it more. You can say that's a really good point. I need to think more about that. Um, but I think it's much better, like they'll appreciate that honesty than if you just make something up that ends up really not making sense. So don't be afraid to say, great question, I'll look into that. Um, another thing that, that I emphasize in a lot of my research that I think some people in these fields don't talk about as much is I think, yeah, giving reasons and evidence is really good. But I also think showing them why God's existence would be a good thing and giving them reasons to want God to exist. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about, I don't think belief is the central thing God wants. I think commitment is the central thing God wants. Commitment might involve this belief-like thing, like I said, but it also involves a desire-like thing. You don't just like have these beliefs 
about your spouse, right? You also think they're a great person and you want to be with them and you have a desire for them, right? And so in the same way, I think desire is really important to Christian commitment as well. And so I think explaining to the person like the differences that God has made in your life or like how good or how loving God is, that that can make them want God to exist. And I think that can go a really long way to helping someone. Um, So kind of three, three last really brief steps. Um, I think inviting them to join a Christian community or even just like you and your friends are going bowling, inviting them to come hang out. Like it doesn't have to always be inviting them to church or Bible study. Um, I think that that can be super helpful, like them seeing a Christian community and kind of being welcomed into that. Um, I think like praying for them is huge, super, super important. I was just reading Um, That verse in Luke where Jesus is talking about the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. It's really interesting that he doesn't say, so, you know, go out and start harvesting. He actually says, pray that God will send out workers. So prayer is like the thing that Jesus emphasizes in that passage before he says, go out and and harvest or whatever. So I I think we we tend to underestimate the importance and power of prayer. Um, So really like having a list of people that you're praying for and really committing to do that, doing that regularly, I think is super important. Um, The last thing I put on here is a little bit of a joke, but also not a joke, which is I've been watching The Chosen. Have you seen that? Yes, it is absolutely wonderful. Oh my gosh, it's so good. It's like a TV show about Jesus's life, but it's not cheesy. Like a lot of the ones I know are like really cheesy or dumb. And you actually just get it on your phone. You uh, download the app, it's called The Chosen. And then you can just like stream it to your TV or I think you can watch it on your phone too, but it's so good. So I just wanted to throw that in there because we've kind of been, my husband and I have been like binging it, um, but it's really, really oh. good. So you can also tell people to watch The Chosen <laughs> uh, as, as part of this, but you know. That's, that's kind of secondary. I think a lot of the other stuff I said is probably more important, but it's a really good show. <laughs> <thrill. laughs> uh, it's all, wow, that's actually a really good answer. Also, The Chosen is for free, so that's good too. Liz, is there anything else you want me to plug before we go? I think if you just type in like Liz Jackson or Liz Jackson philosophy, it should pop up. It's kind of okay. called philosophy, but I couldn't change the actual name to that because it's connected to my Google my Gmail and like, then it would change all of my emails to say philosophy. So, (laughs) um, so philosophy is like the name that I often give it, but if you type in like Liz Jackson philosophy, you should, I guess the only other thing is, um, Liz dash Jackson.com is my website. You can check that out. I have a research page where, um, if you're more interested in like the peer reviewed articles and stuff, there's a bunch on there. And then I also have a public philosophy page. There's a link to my YouTube channel there, but also like blog posts and podcasts that I've done. Um, and if you go on my YouTube channel too, I also have some playlists of like things I've done like this on other people's channels. So I have like a playlist on like talks I've done on faith and like Pascal's wager and different things. So you can go check that out too. Everyone go make sure to subscribe to her channel in the description. All right, so in conclusion, I just want to say thank you so much, Liz, for taking the time to talk with me and talk about these really important subjects of epistemology, ontology, and presuppositionalism and and apologetics in general. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. This has been a really awesome discussion. 